So 11 years ago, two members of our church, Denny Hammock and, and David Parr, agreed to coach a group of youth from Myers Park High School in a Saturday morning basketball league. Now, I wasn't around here at that time, so I'm, I'm relying on, on Denny's recollection of what happened and, and sharing with you today what took place 11 years ago, because it's really important to our church. The young men of this group were from the Greer Heights neighborhood, nearby, rich in history and tradition, but also facing a lot of challenges these days. Sports at Myers Park High School are on a very high level, as many of you know, so making the teams there can be very difficult. A school administrator felt that the Saturday Basketball League might make a good extracurricular option for these young men from Greer Heights and recruited David and Denny to coach them. Now, with all due respect to these two fine gentlemen, however, I don't think it was their coaching prowess that got the attention of the administrator because their team would go 0 and 10 for that season. Nevertheless, the young men on the team were passionate about basketball and each other. They were excited for every practice and game, even though they were outmatched by the competition. They really enjoyed the camaraderie and obviously being with Denny and David. And at the conclusion of the season, the team celebrated with a pizza and ice cream party next to the gym. And as the party was winding down, David and Denny, who were probably relieved to be done with their responsibilities of coaching, they were hurrying out, trying to get on with their Saturday afternoon plans. And one of the young men, Xavier, surprised them with a question, one that both challenged Denny and David as well as inspired them. Xavier said, hey, coach, what's next? What's next? Now, Denny and David struggled at first to come up with a response on the spot, but they finally blurted, well, do you want to come to church with us in the morning? Immediately, eight hands shot up into the air, and the What's Next ministry was born, all because of a simple but profound question asked by a ninth grader. This mentoring ministry has not only blessed the young men who have participated in it, but frankly, it's blessed all of us in this church. It's made us a better church than we had been before. Praise the Lord for what's next. What's next? That's essentially the same question asked by the disciples in today's scripture reading from Acts that we just heard a few moments ago. According to Luke, the author of Acts, as well as the gospel bearing his name, after Jesus' crucifixion and resurrection from the dead, he appeared among them for a period of 40 days. And at the end of that period, when they were all assembled, they asked Jesus, what's next? Well, not literally, but that's basically what they were wondering. Lord, is this the time when you will restore the kingdom to Israel? That's the actual question they posed to Jesus. Now, if you look carefully, you'll see two components in it. One is a matter of timing. Is something going to happen now? Is this the time? Are we there yet is a question that many of you have heard your younger children ask, right? When they're very young, as you're driving on those long car trips again and again and again, are we there yet? Are we there yet? Even from an early age, we want to know when something is going to happen. The other part of the question asked by the disciples is what? What's about to happen? They offered the answer, but they wanted Jesus to confirm their hopes and dreams. Are you, and, and the word finally is probably implied here, going to restore the kingdom to Israel? In, in other words, are you finally going to set things right in the world? So, flipping the order of those two components, you get the very question Xavier asked of Denny and David. What's next? You know, I don't want to have to keep saying Denny and David. I kind of feel like referring to them as D2, but then that Star Wars comes to mind, R2-D2, so I guess that probably won't work either. In any event, Denny and David responded to their what's next question by inviting the boys to church the next day. Jesus replied to the disciples what's next question by telling them that the timing wasn't for them to know. That was only God's knowledge. Only God knew that. But what would happen is that they would receive power from the Holy Spirit, and then they would be Jesus' witnesses in an ever-expanding in ever expanding concentric circles of geography, from Jerusalem in the, in the epicenter, and then to all of Judea and Samaria, and finally to the ends of the earth. So God has big plans 
for the disciples, or more accurately, for all the world. And the disciples are those through whom God will work to fulfill that mission. Now, this is not exactly what the disciples had in mind, though. I suppose they were likely expecting Jesus to make a clean sweep of things, including and especially of the Roman occupiers of Palestine at that time. But here Jesus is saying instead that his kingdom will be established in all the world, not by the brute force used by earthly powers, but rather by word of mouth, spoken lovingly person to person until all people had received the good news of life that he offers to the world. His power would be demonstrated in grace rather than by the sword. So what Jesus seems to be doing is calling his disciples, his followers, which would include you and me, to an in-between time. We are post-resurrection people. Jesus has risen from the dead. That we proclaim and that we live. Jesus has ushered in a new kingdom, God's kingdom on earth. But it would also appear that while God's kingdom is breaking into the world, it's entering and displacing the man-made, sin-infected, broken kingdoms over time rather than all at once. Hence, in addition to proclaiming as our faith that Christ has died and Christ is risen, we also affirm that Christ will come again. And Jesus is saying that this process is taking place through us until he returns in final glory. You will be my witnesses. I read about a Mercedes-Benz television commercial years ago that I, I can't remember it, but evidently one of the, it featured one of their cars crashing into a concrete wall as part of a safety test, and I guess standing up to the impact fairly well. A spokesperson for the company is interviewed and asked why Mercedes doesn't enforce its patent on the design of its vehicles, enabling them to absorb so much energy on impact, making its cars safer, something copied by its competitors without, comp without objection by Mercedes. The company spokesman says in the commercial, because some things in life are too important not to share. Some things in life are too important not to share. The good news of Jesus Christ is certainly something too important not to share. Jesus is calling all of his followers to be witnesses of his grace. Now witnesses, they report on what they have seen and what they have heard and thus we are called to share our own experiences with the risen Christ and his love. How have we seen Jesus in our lives? What have we heard him whisper into our hearts? How has he touched us and changed us by his mercy and grace. Our witness is drawn from our own day-to-day -day experiences with Jesus. That's what makes our witness genuine and thus effective. Now, having said that, one still ought to be careful in how one communicates that message. I read the story of a barber who felt led to share his faith with his customers. And as the story goes, when the sun rose the next day and the barber got up out of bed, he said, today I'm going to witness to the first man who walks through my door. Soon after he opened his shop, the first man came in and said, I want to shave. The barber went to the back and prayed a quick, desperate prayer. He's saying, God, the first customer came in, and I'm going to witness to him. So please give me the wisdom to know just the right thing to say to him. Amen. And then quickly the barber came out, and with razor knife in one hand and a Bible in the other, saying, Good morning, sir. I have a question for you. Are you ready to die? Maybe there's a better way for him to share his faith. At least he was sharing it, though. Now, I don't know if the story is true or not, probably not, but either way, the problem with his witness began before the man opened his mouth. Did you notice that twice a form of the word quick appeared in the story? The barber said a quick prayer, and then he quickly rushed out to witness to the customer, razor and Bible in hand. Perhaps he should have slowed down before racing to do what he felt called to do. In today's scripture, after Jesus ascends into heaven and the two men, perhaps angels, although Luke doesn't actually say, ask the disciples why they're staring in the, at what they're staring at in the sky, the disciples return to Jerusalem into the upper room. And what do they do there? Luke says all of them, all of them, along with some women, including Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers, were constantly devoting themselves to prayer. Jesus had laid out the plan for them. The what in what's next is clear and it's big. They'll witness to the ends of the earth. 
But the when isn't exactly spelled out. Jesus speaks in the future tense. You will be my witnesses. Before that, he says, you will receive power from the Holy Spirit. Again, the future tense. So what the disciples apparently realize is that a first step in responding to Christ's call is to wait and pray. 20th century theologian Karl Barth calls the period between Jesus' ascension and Pentecost a significant pause. The disciples waited and prayed during this interim period. Perhaps so should we. The Bible is replete with positive references to waiting. Wait for the Lord, be strong, and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord, the writer of Psalm concludes that Psalm. Blessed are those who wait for him, says Isaiah. The prophet also says that those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. While waiting and praying are depicted as two primary activities of a faithful church, says Bishop Will Willimon, he adds that waiting is an onerous burden for us computerized and technically impatient moderns who live in an age of instant everything, and thus also making it one of the tough tasks of the church. But waiting is what we're evidently supposed to do. And it's what the disciples did as they also prayed constantly They must have been excited about what Jesus had called them to in witnessing on his behalf to all the world, but they also knew the importance of waiting and praying. It reminds me of something that I've I've learned again and again with regard to the will of God. It's not only a matter of direction, in other words, where God is leading us to go, but it's also a matter of timing, of when we should proceed with God's plan. I experienced that in my own life when I felt a calling to the ministry. While I, practiced, while I was a practicing attorney in Virginia. The new direction for my life suddenly became clear, but I also remember after receiving the calling a feeling that I was to wait. I was super excited about as I was aiming for the ministry, but something or someone was telling me to wait. In looking back, that added delay made a lot of sense in how things unfolded, and it provided me more time to pray and prepare for and grow into the role of a pastor. Maureen Landock, in reflecting on today's scripture and on how the disciples didn't take off right away to be Christ's witnesses, says that bearing witness to Christ is not so much striving toward somewhere, but resting in someone. Let me say that again. Bearing witness to Christ is not so much striving toward somewhere, but resting in someone. And I put the capital S on someone. But waiting and praying, she points out, by doing those things, we become better prepared for sharing the good news of Jesus Christ as we grow in awareness of God's presence and receptivity to God's indwelling spirit. In other words, waiting and praying transform us internally so that we can act externally in witnessing on behalf of Jesus. Both the internal and the external are important in our walk with Jesus. Or said another way, Landock observes, being Christ's disciples means we bear witness to Christ not only in our going and doing, but also in our being and waiting. Waiting is part of the journey itself, a journey more focused on going deeper than on going forward. Waiting is a part of the journey itself. Let me wrap this up by saying this. The disciples have given us the GPS for our faith journey. Just as when driving here in Charlotte, it's a matter of direction and timing, right? When you're planning a trip, it's direction, but it's also timing. It's not just where you're headed, but also when you leave that affects how well your drive will go. Likewise, our faith journey is not just a matter of where God is leading us, but also when we proceed. And sometimes we must wait and pray before we embark on the journey so as to go deeper in our relationship with God in Christ. By waiting and praying, our hearts and our minds are more likely opened to discovering God's truths, God's wisdom, God's love. And that makes all the difference in our journey of faith.